Now, um, on tonight's speaker, she has given me the go-ahead to say whatever I want to say. <laughs> and I thought I had better ask her if there was anything that she wanted me to say. And she said, say whatever you want to. I uh, got to the airport uh, after Holly's flight got in yesterday. We were about 10 minutes late getting there. And she found us. We didn't find her. We had a nice ride back from the airport, and I spent a lot of time with Holly. And I'll tell you, she's got a message for us. I know that, and I'm going to call her a real alcoholic. And at this minute, I'm going to turn the meeting over to you, Holly. Help me welcome Holly from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Holly, and I'm an alcoholic. First, I want to thank Yvonne and Don and everybody else that invited me to be here this evening. It is indeed a pleasure, and I have run into so many of my old friends that I have met before, so I know you didn't come just to hear me. You came because you wanted to come to the conference and to have a nice dinner like we had tonight. Uh, so you will put up with me. I hope you will be like a uh, little youngster that had gone to school one day and he had just been circumcised the day before and he wasn't too comfortable. And uh, the teacher asked him what was wrong and he was squirming and uh, he wasn't going to tell her I've just been circumcised. So he squirmed some more. So she told him, you go down to the principal's office. You're sitting there squirming. So he goes to the principal's office and the principal asks him, what's wrong with you? He's not going to tell him what happened either. So the principal said, well, I tell you what you do. Are you sick? He said, yeah. He said, well, you just go back to your room and stick it out till noon. <laughs> so if y'all will just stick it out till the dance time. I mean, well, literally, they, you know what I mean, you know those kind of things. There's one thing about being with my people, as I like to think of you, because you are definitely first with me always. Many times after we have come into the fellowship, there are a lot of people that get a little resentful. Not everybody is delighted. Oh, she's quit drinking. You know, there's always that leech that gets kind of mad when you don't drink with them anymore because you don't spend any money on them and they don't like you too well. But so there was such a fellow as that. There's plenty of other fellows like that, you know. And uh, so I figured, well, all right, I'm going to get even with him. He doesn't buy me anything to drink anymore and he won't drink with me. So you know how people like to do you when uh, they're jealous of you. So he started in on the man and he says, you know, your kids aren't any better than anybody else's kids on the block. He said, yes, I know that. See, this man by now had learned tolerance and, you know, that sort of thing. So he said, I know that my children aren't any better than anybody else. And he says, and your wife isn't all that good a cook either. See, they'd quit asking him over to eat, so he's mad about that too. And uh, he says, in that church you go to, your preacher's not so hot. Uh, he said, well, there's a lot of preachers that are not so hot. Well, I'm not talking about anybody here. Uh, <laughs> But uh, he said, uh, now in that other thing you go to, two or three, three or four times a week, he says, you know, I don't see how you stand that thing. What do you call it? A, A, A. You know how people want to do us that way. And he said, uh, that thing must be like Noah's Ark. He said, I've heard all about it. He says, you know, uh, anytime anything's got that many people in it, it's got to be like Noah's Ark. He said, uh, I heard there's a lot of gossip going on in there. And there's even some filth going on in there. And he says, you know, in, Ad in, in Noah's Ark, with all those animals, there was some filth and there was some gossip. And the man finally looked at him. He'd stepped on his Achilles heel by then. He says, you know, yes, that AAA thing you're talking about, Alcoholics Anonymous, he says, it is rather like Noah's Ark. He says, it's very much like Noah's Ark. We might have a little gossip and once in a while a little dirt. 
He said, but like Noah's Ark, everybody that stays in it stays dry. And so, <laughs> so, uh, so he did get a little bit teed off. You know, as one, as this book here tells us, as we tread our happy road to destiny, we're going to run into all kinds of things. I've run into a few of them myself. You know, people will say, you don't ever drink anymore. I said, well, not when I'm sober, I don't. Well, that confuses the daylight side of them. She don't drink when she's sober. Well, why not she gets drunk? And uh, then uh, you'll also have the good friend that's going to tell you sometimes, well, now, you're not an alcoholic anymore. You're an ex-alcoholic. Now, you haven't ever heard of such a thing as an ex-horse or an ex-dog or something, you know. <laughs> you're, just, you're that, you're just that, you know. And oftentimes you're going to, there's no need to keep on explaining, you, you can't, for those of us that know why no explanation is necessary, for those that don't know, there's just none possible, so you just have to let it go with that. Now, uh, now dear, you can just forget about the past, just forget all about that, you know, and uh, you don't still have to associate with those people, because, uh, you know, you're a changed person, and you say, well, I wish you would change, you know, that's what you begin to think about them. But once one has his or her roots in this organization of ours, we stay here. I said when we have our roots, regardless of how much we have changed, we stay here. But the very simple reason is I read a lovely story about a little girl that saw a lovely flower growing in the dirt where flowers grow, you know, roots was there. And she said, you know, it's a shame that that lovely flower it's planted out there in all that dark dirt. So she pulls the flower up, she takes it over to the hydrant, and she washes the roots. She takes and pours, the, lets the water run on it and washes the roots. And then she takes and plants it over into the sand. You know what happened? The flower died, you know? And that I know what happened to me. Once my roots are firmly planted in something that has given me strength, that has given me life, has given me the sun, that Almighty God wanted me to have all of these things. If all of a sudden I become an ex-alcoholic and go wash my roots for something else, I will die. There's no doubt about it. Because before here, coming here, I might as well have been for the existence that I thought that I had and was merely an existence, and that was all. You know, there's something to me that is absolutely wonderful when I'm invited, shall we say, to speak on uh, Saturday night. For a simple reason is the first time I heard of this fellowship of ours was on a Saturday night. It all started, the miracle started for me on a Saturday night. I happened to be home this Saturday night. I cannot tell you for the world why I was home. You know, I... Uh, was generally, that was always generally my busy night, but I must have just have gotten fired or something. I attended bar for a number of years. I believed in on the job training. And, uh, <laughs> but for this reason, for some unknown reason, I happened to be on. And the television was on. And I did not turn the television on to this particular station because when you are in my condition, you don't turn things on to any station. You hear voices all the time anyway, so it doesn't matter. But this particular night, a story came on over the radio, and it was called A Glass Crutch. It was about a woman that had a drinking problem. To this day, I do not remember any of the ingredients of that story. All I know it was about it, it was called The Glass Crutch, and it was about a woman that had a drinking problem. I don't remember any of the ingredients. Well, by then, I uh, was a full-fledged undiluted alcoholic when I heard this story. In fact, I was sitting there drinking my favorite beverage, which was wine. Uh, I always felt it was very sophisticated for women to drink wine. You know, I said, you know, it looks rather sophisticated to drink for women to drink wine. Have you ever seen anybody drinking mad dog that was sophisticated? <laughs> the most unsophisticated beverage you can drink. I'll tell you that. Now you're going to sit there and say, oh, she's a wino. I'm not a wino. Women are not winos, they're wine nets. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, but as I sat there that night, I thought to myself, now if that woman would just quit drinking whatever she's drinking, and you know, and participate, you know, in the lighter beverages, 20% very light beverage, you know, one of those kind of things. But you know, that story stayed with me for a long time. And I'm going to tell you that, to tell you this, because of this. Many times when you and I carry the message, you think, what was the use of my going there? It hasn't done one bit of good. But my friends, just wait. Because I don't know whether it was four or five or what, years later. But all during that time, these words stayed on my mind. The glass crutch. It haunted me. If any of you have ever read The Hound of Heaven, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. It pursued me. Can you imagine anyone or anything pursuing you to give you life? There's got to be love there. One does not pursue someone to give you life when you're trying on every way to kill yourself. And God is pursuing you that you might have life. And you keep running. And I heard many times when I would walk down the street, I thought I heard, or the heel plates on my shoes would beat out the words, the glass crutch, the glass crutch. It seemed as if that is what it was saying to me. Yeah. But I wasn't ready for none of this nonsense. In fact, I didn't know what the words the glass crutch meant. I had no idea. And finally one day, now this didn't happen every week or every month, but it did happen. Yeah. Finally, one day I was sitting trying to read the newspaper and it seemed as if every word on that paper said the glass crutch and I said, my Lord, what does this mean? It dawned on me. Holly Martin, you cannot even read the newspaper without the glass crutch because there I sat holding the glass. Now it would sound dramatic to say immediately I dropped the glass and I ran to the phone. Oh no, not me. <laughs> For a simple reason is, but uh, you see, most of the time, it is hard for a person, the hardest thing for an alcoholic like me to know when there's something wrong with me, to know that there's something wrong with me. You know, there's something wrong with everybody else, not me. Okay. But finally that day came when I did. They told me the number would be the first one in the book, but I didn't believe them. You see, I didn't believe anything anybody said, unless they had a brown bag. Okay. Uh, finally I did go to the phone there, phone book, and I looked in that book, and there it was, lo and behold, the first number in the book, like they said it was going to be, it was there. And I called that number. Yeah. I don't know why, but for the grace of God, I did call that number. Yeah. And this lady, she wanted to get personal with me. She wanted to know my last name and where I lived and all that kind of stuff. And you don't tell strangers things like that, you know. Finally, she got my name out of me, and she said, uh, we'll have, uh, well, first, um, I told her when I first talked to her, I said, you know, I got a friend out here I think is losing her mind. And uh, she said, would you like to have somebody come and talk to you? I said, oh, no, oh, goodbye. Finally, I called back. And in those days when I came into the fellowship and they said, we will send somebody out to see you, they meant it that they would send someone out. And they came. People sponsored you. They took you hostage. They really did. <laughs> so this lady, before she came out, she said to me, this person that uh, was going to wind up being one of my sponsors, she said, uh, and now um, I understand that you have a problem. Well, I didn't understand that either. What do you mean I got a problem? She said, a drinking problem. Well, I couldn't know how to answer that. I was having a problem getting it, but I wouldn't have no problem drinking it. I didn't get that. So uh, she finally made a little sense there, and she says, well, I'm coming out to see you, and if you have anything out there to drink, get rid of it. I did. I drank it up right away. And uh, she's coming. Yeah. So you see, I'm not going to give you a blow-by-blow -blow description of my drinking preceding this because I'm sure everybody in this room, you know, knows how to drink. All you got to do is open your mouth and swallow it. You get drunk. You do it long enough and often enough. That sort of thing. 
And I had been through all of the things that people go through with, you know, trying not to get drunk. I did not want to quit drinking. I just didn't want to get drunk. Yeah. And I used to go around with an old dame. She was about the age I am now, you know. And uh, what are you laughing about? Uh, you know, you're supposed to start out telling people, well, I was born to such and such a time and... Uh, when you were born. Well, I was born, that's obvious, and when I was born, there's none of your business. <laughs> so, so that's the way I looked at that. But anyway, she came out. She said, when she came out, you know, uh, that woman gave me one of the most profound messages in a very few words. When she, by the time she got there, you know, I was standing looking out the window, <laughs> and I said, my two children, I had gotten married, I like other people, you know, but marriage is like vaccinations on me they don't take. And, uh, <laughs> and when she got there, I was looking out of the window, and I said to her, I have got to do something on account of my children. And this is the most profound message that she gave me. You do something for you. Your children will be all right. And my friends, you know, that is true. You do something for you. Everything's going to turn out all right. It's like the man that was very, very busy one day, extremely busy, and his child wanted to play with him. And he didn't have time to play with his child. And he had a big picture on the wall of the map of the world. And uh, he tore the map up into a whole lot of pieces. And he told his son, he said, uh, Now, son, you put this map together. And by the time you get the map together, Daddy will be through and you and I can play together. Well, in a very short time, the youngster came back into the room and he had the map all together. And his father said to him, how in the world did you get this map together so soon? He says, father, on the other side of the map, there was a picture of a man. And when I got the man together, the whole world fell in place. And that is the way that it is, my friend. Once I, as this book tells me, get my house in order, the whole world will fall in place. I mean, now, I won't stand here tonight and tell you, oh... Everything just changed immediately. The cow don't move anymore. The cat doesn't meow. The dog don't bark. They raise as much hell now as they ever did. Only thing ever did is I can hear them, you know? So, if, you know, I mean, I can cope with them, you know, and those kind of things. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing, and I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, you know? So, nevertheless, when this lady came to see me, she told me I will be back tonight to take you to a meeting. Well, there was an old dame that I started to tell you about that lived down the street from me. It was always trying to educate me about drinking. You know, she said to me, uh, see, she needed me like I needed her. Because, you know, she was going in and out of the bars and she felt that no self-respecting gentleman would buy the new dollar drink without buying the old dollar drink, you know. And see, I know about that because I've played on both leagues. I know how it works, you know. <laughs> and uh, anyway, she had told me all of these things that didn't work. She had told me, you know, I used to try to tell her how sick I got when I drank. And she would tell me, well, now, if you just take a little olive oil before we go out tonight, you won't vomit and you won't be sick. Now, olive oil, she tells me. So I drank a little olive oil. Instead of being a long, tall, puking drunk, I was a long, tall, greasy puking drunk. It's the only difference. <laughs> and I would try to tell her about these hangovers. She said, now, dear, tonight, before you go to bed, if you'll just get a bottle of beer, and you open it and sit it down beside of your bed, and let it get flat and drink it first thing in the morning, you will not have a hangover. There's no way in the world I could go to sleep with a full bottle of beer sitting down beside the bed. <laughs> so, you see, this did not work. None of the things that they told me did not work. So now I'm going to try this AAA thing, you know. Thank God for that. And you know, I would think about all of these. That day I sat there, and I, I don't know any, didn't know anything about inventory, but it came to me. I began to think back over all of the things that had not worked. So this was not going to work either, but I would go and see, you know. So here she comes. But do you know, alcohol is everything this book says it is cunning, baffling, and powerful. And just about. A few minutes before time for me to go to that first meeting. Now, have you ever got to the place in life uh, where 
if you drank, you didn't get drunk, and if you didn't drink, you didn't get sober. You know, one of those kind of things. Kind of in the twilight zone deal. Well, you see, I was doing all right in the twilight zone. Fine. Here comes along two lush head buddies of mine, and they give me two or three drinks, and it was the same as pouring coal all on dying embers. I got drunk. Hi, feeling real good. Well, she drugged me to that meeting anyway. I'm telling you the truth, I had some of the dragonless sponsors you ever seen in your life. They would... See, nowadays, you know, people very timidly say, Would you care to go to a meeting tonight? You don't talk to alcoholics like that. Say, I will be there. And you be there. Because we're going, where? To a meeting. You know, this cuddling deal about, I don't want to hurt his or her feelings, I'll run him away. Where in the hell, I mean, where in the heck is he going to run? He hasn't got anywhere to run, you know. So, okay, if he runs, that's all right. He'll run right back again, or he'll fall and stumble, and you pick him up, and then you run together, one of those kind of things. Well, nevertheless, I went to this first meeting. I don't remember too much about that meeting. All I remember that three other women, there wasn't too many women in the program at that time, and uh, three other women uh, jumped up and said, we'll help you with it. They thought they was going to get to be my pallbearers. And you know, and I outlived all of them. <laughs> well, I'll run into them again one day. <laughs> I hope so. But nevertheless, that was the beginning of my Saturday night miracle. Now to tell you, I immediately fell in love with the program. I did not. Did not fall immediately in love with anything. See, when I came in AA, I hated everybody. And after I got sober, I just hated the people I knew, you know, one of those kind of things. <laughs> and my sponsor was in that bunch. Because I could not stand that woman, you know, she had buck teeth and I knew where she was going to bite me or smile at me, you know. <laughs> and uh, she was always whist- pulling out this who me on me. And just saying, this answer yes to three, dear, and you're in. And I thought this old bitty must be getting 50 cents a yes or something. Is drinking clouding your reputation? Well, the way I thought, well, if I've been, you've been in the fog long as I have, you don't know whether it's cloudy or not. And then she would say, uh, uh, come up with some stupid thing like this about uh, all those questions. She would pick out the, her three favorites. Do you seek a lower environment while drinking? Why, heavens, no. I merely created a lower environment while drinking, you know. And then she asked one of the, what you, call, what, what you might call a down-to-earth foolish question. Do you prefer to drink alone? If I'm buying it, yes. If you're buying it, no. Well, okay. I said, uh, so. So I began to feel about that woman like a lot of men feel about their wives. I wish you would go somewhere, but don't go so far I can't find you if I need you, you know. <laughs> Just go away. <laughs> but she was there. I'm telling you, that woman was right there. God bless her wherever she is today, you know. So this thing went on and on, and naturally, there was a change. Very slight to begin with, very slight. See, I did not know what you were talking about. Yeah? I did not know what you were talking about. See, when I came into the fellowship, we, we, we didn't have, you know, all those nice pads that you can go to now, one of those kind of things. You suffered. I mean, you suffered uh, rehabilitation and all like that. No, 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 no. Uh-uh. You suffered through this thing. When I came into AA, they, the house where I lived at, uh, they had one or two rooms in the hospital there that they allowed alcoholics in. The doctor would come in and see about them. You know, he'd come in and see them. Pretty nice old guy. But whoever brought you there to that hospital, we took shifts. I would stay with you or until it was time if you needed hospitalization. And wasn't that many needed it, you know. They, just, they told you, go get a job. You'd be all right. And they meant it. But you would sit with that person until somebody else came in and they'd sit. And, you know, we made it. We did pretty good, you know, on those kind of things. We didn't have too much literature, but we read what we had, you know. We had a big book, oh, goodness gracious. I can remember many times all that was on that literature table was the upper room in the big book. It was there. I guess you're saying, what a how old that old boy broad really is. I ain't going to tell you. So, yes. Yeah. So, anyway... 
as time went on, see, we talked about the steps all the time. We really and truly did. That was, that was and t today, my friends, that is the program, is the steps. You know, that's it. The big book is great. I love it. Believe everything in it. But there's some work to be done. Because why? It tells us here are the steps we took. Yeah. So evidently, you know, just read the black. Don't pay attention to the white there. Don't look at that. Just read what it says. See, all of those other things is leading right up to that. But you know, those are the commandments, the 12 steps. You see, when the world was still fresh from the hands of Almighty God, it got sick. And our divine Lord gave the world then 10 doses of medicine. Ten Commandments. Here come along a jerk like me that gets sicker yet. So what does he do? He gives us 12 doses of medicine. Because we're just, I'm just that sick. Yeah. So I began to look at these 12 doses of medicine. And I began to put forth a feeble effort in trying to take these 12 doses of medicine. And it seemed to me, my friends, that it was like the 12 months of the year. When I looked at that first step where we admitted that we were powerless over alcohol and our lives had become unmanageable, it reminded me so much of how I felt. It reminded me so much of the month of January. You know, in January, it's quite a letdown. The holidays are just over with. And you know, when you get to that place in life where it looks like all the joy has gone out of, out of your life. Have you ever looked at a downtown street after they, you know, you went for months and the lights was on, the Christmas months was, Christmas lights were on, and everything was gay and festive and happy. And then here comes along January. See, when I was drinking, I thought I was happy. I wasn't happy. Sometimes we put on that front. And then after they take the Christmas tree lights down and the street lights down, doesn't that street, doesn't that town look dirty and deserted? Everything looks shoddy. And then we got that month of January. It's cold, it's desolate, it's gray, relentless. And that coldness hangs on and on. And you're powerless to do anything about it. So what do you do? So we just shake and grip. And that's what I did in that first step. It seemed like when I looked at that step where we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and our lives had become unmanageable, it seems like all of that seemed to come to me of what that powerlessness, that unmanageability. You know, sometimes in January when the weather is so bad that all the lines, the telephone lines come down and there's no communication. And that's what it meant to me. Your powerlessness, Holly. Your unmanageability. There's no communication with anybody. It's cold, it's gray. Can you remember just before you came in? That's why I got to keep my feet in that dirt that I was planted in. Because I remember that. I remember those, that coldness, that relentless. Have you ever woke up and you hated yourself? You ever woke up in the morning and you were scared when you woke up? You wanted to go to the bathroom, but somebody's going to say to you, you're just now coming in? And you don't want to hear that. You say, you don't go to the bathroom. You look at the clock, the clock says six, and you don't know what six it is. Yeah? And finally you lay, you wish somebody would fry some bacon, go to work, or do something so it'd give you an idea what time of day it is. Yeah. And finally... You say, well, I'll go get me a drink of water. And you say, well, if I go out there and get a drink of water, they're going to say the same thing to me. Are you coming in or going out? So you don't want to answer. So you lay there and you suffer at both ends. Do you remember that? You know what I mean? Finally, when I compare that to the month of January, I realized what I had to do. The same thing that I do. Accept it and surrender. Once I can accept it and surrender to this first step, say, the lines of communication become alive again. Say. 
and I can hang in there and I can grip. And I put a good grip on it. And I say, this is it. Do you want it back? No. So because I can remember that. And finally, as I look again, when I come to believe in a power greater than myself that can restore me to sanity, sane thinking. You know how it is in this month, February. Everything's been cold for so long, and one finally sees a little ray of sunshine. Isn't it wonderful? Sometimes we call it at home, I don't know what you call it, but we call it the February thaw. A ray of sunshine. And oh, how you rejoice, you know. Something you say is going to get better. Something is, I have something really to hold on to. I have something to believe in. Because they told me you come to believe in a power greater than yourself that could restore you to sanity. You know, that chill of night that threatens my recovery is banished by that little ray of sunshine at last. Oh, sure, I always believed that there was a God. I'm not going to... See, I was brought up to believe that there was a God. See? But I didn't believe that he cared anything about me. Oh, I think, well, he, sometimes, you know, he might once in a while. But to believe God and to believe in God is to, to believe that there is a God, you know, but to believe in him is something else. Because it's a known fact that one does not believe in a power greater than himself. He does not believe in God. He's going to create one. Yeah. So one has to believe. I do. I don't say you do. I say I have to. So I say I believe that there was a God. In fact, I used to pray to him. And I would pray long prayers. Dear God, don't let me get drunk. But I never asked God not to let me drink. But I said, oh, dear God, don't let me get drunk, please. I didn't ask him to keep me sober. Just in other words, I wanted him on my terms. Let me do as I want to do, you know. One of those kind of things. Let me drink, you know, be a superhuman. It's like, you know, every 10 years or so, somebody comes up with something new in the program in AA, and uh, they think they do, but they don't. And uh, with some new pill or something that you can take. And here's, the, I remember when I first came in, they'd come along with something about... Um, if you, you will be able, if you take this, why, uh, you can drink all you want to drink and nothing will happen. Well, I can go drink water and nothing will happen as far as they're concerned. Why in the world are you going to, who wants to drink and nothing happens? That's why you drink, so something will happen. Now, you're going to go out and spend perfectly good, beautiful money to buy something so you can drink and nothing will happen. <laughs> no, that makes sense. But now, when I look at that ray of sunshine, which get, as and you and I both know, as the days get longer and warmer, that ray of sunshine stays with us longer and warmer. You know? And hence it was with me in the second step. The longer I hung around, the dearer it became to me. That no longer did I have to create me a God. One that was going to... Dance to my tune. No, no. Uh-uh. And then came March. Oh, boy, isn't March changeable? Very changeable, isn't it? I know it is where I live. Made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God. It's just like March. One minute you take it. You, oh, God, here, please take my will and my life. It's all yours. And the next minute, well, I think I better try this my way, you know? you know. The winds keep changing back us and forwards, back us and forwards. To stand here tonight and tell you, oh, I work the third step in its entirety beautifully every day. I sure, but I keep changing back us and forwards. I say, wait a minute. Uh-uh. What did you wake up this morning with? Didn't you ask this morning? For, the, for God to take your will and your life into, into his keeping? Didn't you ask that? Now, what do you want to do this for? Come on, Holly. Forget about the winds of March. Read the step again and see what it says. Made a decision to turn our will and our lives, well, over to the care of God, is what it says. You know, sometimes you say, oh, you know, I made a decision to turn my will and my life over to God. I didn't say that. It says over to the care of 
Again, you've read the white and you didn't read the black, you know. In other words, what it is telling me, any time you get so smart, you can take it back. Any time you get ready, if you're willing to suffer the consequences, then you can take it back, you know. So regardless of what the situation is, I realize to keep my feet firmly planted where they belong, I must do what Steph says. But that changeability will happen from time to time, vacillating backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. But you notice one thing? As March begins to die out, the winds begin to die down, don't they? As we begin to practice the third step, it gets a little easier, doesn't it? Because of the consequences. So it gets easier. Now along comes the month of April. Oh boy, this is a beautiful one. You know. Well, one again is given privilege there to make a searching and fearless moral inventory of herself. You know. In other words, new birth. That's what one looks for. That's why it is suggested for me that I take a searching and fearless moral inventory that I might find this resurrection in the Christian world and supposedly in our world too. We call it the resurrection. You know? That which was in me that was once good is now dead. Let me take a searching and fearless moral inventory. Many times in taking a searching and fearless moral inventory, my friends, it's like going out in the month of April and you see nothing but chill and mud. According to what kind of inventory you take. Nothing but, oh, I don't see anything but nothing just bad about me. Oh, you've got a lot of good things about you. But what happened? They got baked down in mud, did they not? You know, what am I really looking for? I'll tell you what I'm looking for. I'm searching for the real me. Made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. I am really and truly looking for me. A searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Who am I searching ourselves for? What am I searching me for? So I can find me. No. It didn't tell me to take a searching and fearless moral inventory of all that wine I drank. No. But of me. That's what I'm searching for. You know, many times that... Easter time, at this time of year, that time of year rather, one buys new outfits. If you don't buy them for yourself, you'll buy them for your children. You will buy a new outfit. But with us people like me, the new outfit has to come from within. You know? You say, well, I don't think I need an inventory. It really isn't necessary because I am really straightening up fine. That's beautiful. But unless I take a searching and fill a small inventory and let my new outfit come from within, it's the same as taking a bath with all your clothes on and no soap, you're just all wet. And it don't work like that. My new outfit, my friends, had to come from within. I'm still working on it today. So are you satisfied with the one that you have? No. I can still work on it. That's what gives me a pleasure. So that's what I must do. Now, along comes May. They told me things would get better in this program. But there was a fifth step to deal with, you know. They said, well, you know, April showers bring May flowers and all that sort of stuff. And it does. But when it comes down to that fifth step, but to admit to God, ourselves, and another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. Sure, things will get better once I do this. Exact nature. You know, many times, my friends, when one goes out and looks at what is coming up out of the ground, many times the flower and the weed, when they are quite small, look alike, do they not? But they're not alike. Only as they grow an experienced eye, an experienced hand, you knew what had been planted there. So what must happen? I must find out exactly which is the flower and exactly which is the weed. Why? There's got to be a separation because that weed, the roots of the weed, is so strong. 
And I have to find out exactly which is which because the weed, the roots of that weed will strangle that little flower and it'll kill it. So there's got to be, for me, a separation. A separation tells me this, that I must name it. This is what has got to come out of here. Name it and subdue it. Well, you know, sometimes, oh, you know, I have many things wrong with me. You know, I don't know just which is which. You know, keep it on, just keep on. You know which is which, the exact nature. You will know exactly the weed from the flower. And you will know exactly that that flower, and regardless of how much progress that I might have made until I make this separation, the strongest root is going to kill the weakest one. So what must I do? Like, well, I can just leave this alone. Mm -mm. No, 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 no. Just leave it alone and let it strangle me. And this I cannot stand for again. Many times I looked at this fifth step and I said, well, you know, the exact nature of my wrong, you know, sometimes I, you'd get so, I'd get so disgusted with myself. And, I said, well, the exact nature of my wrongs isn't me. It was my father and mother. They shouldn't have had me. That's their wrongs, not mine. I said, well, you're here now. You've got to do something about it, you know. Name it and subdue it. That is the beginning, you know, of the beginning of a little humility. Just a wee bit. Not, not too much because the minute that, you know, you think, oh, I have become so humble. Oh, brother, you better watch that when you become, oh, I'm just so humble. <laughs> you can just see that rope dropping down around your neck, choking, choking the hell out of you, you know. <laughs> that halo coming, falling down, just choking you. I've never yet reached that height of humility. Because why? After the fifth step, there's a step there, you know, these steps are so beautifully written ready to have God remove all the defects of character. That's the June. Oh, brother. You know, sometimes in June we have a lot of thunderstorms and we have a lot of tornadoes and all that kind of stuff. Well, why not? You're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character? That will cause the heat is on. That will cause thunderstorms and tornadoes right there. To remove my character defects? Oh. All of them? No, no. I can't go for that. You know. What will this do to my image? What image? Well, you know, I've created an image. And, you know, after all, I'm supposed to have this violent temper, and I'm supposed to be like this. This is part of my image. And, you know, people won't recognize me. And I'm not sure that I want to give all this up. I thought you made a decision to turn your will and your life over to the care of God. Now you're not sure you want to give it all up, huh? El Toro Poo Poo. No. No. That is it. And then along comes a lovely month called July, and everybody feels, well, you know, I've been around the program for a little while. This is my thinking, not yours. Been around the program. I can go on a brief vacation. I don't need to go to too many meetings right now because it's July and we're going to have a holiday coming up. It's the 4th of July. But don't go 4th or the 5th on the 4th. It won't work. You know, it just never has. You know. And this is called freedom. The 4th of July is the freedom month. And by the time that I get to this seventh step, humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. Why? Freedom. It may be all right on the 4th for other people to go for us on the 5th or the 4th, but not me. Mm -mm. Because this is again reminding me, humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. This, shall we say, is strengthening my freedom. Yeah. See, but now there's something else that I have to watch for. See, it is the little bitty things that stand in the way sometimes, you know. You know, a little bitty firecracker on the 4th of July. I have to watch out for those fireworks when it comes down to humbling myself. I have to watch out for that. See, it's the small things. The small things that cause the big fireworks. You know, they're not as big as this thing. You know, a little bitty something like this. Well, my gracious. Or raise more hell than a one-legged man at a dance, as far as that's concerned. But it's the small things that can stand in my way. 
to this brief vacation. Where I feel, oh, well, you know, after all. See, a brief vacation can lead to a longer vacation. And I must realize that when I get to this step, that what is this doing? It is strengthening, telling me, Holly, your force is meant for the freedom in your life. You must try to keep it there. And that's because it is a new kind of freedom. It is the kind of freedom that no longer, that it's a people-pleasing freedom. It's my freedom, you know. Because if I continue on to my short vacation, I will come into the month of August, you know. I will forget all, but you know, in August it is very, very hot, you know, and we think, oh, well, you know, I got it made. I don't need to go to any meetings and all that sort of thing. And I don't need to make any amends. I don't need to do anything about amends. I'm sober. So I can do as I please. Uh Uh-uh. If you think along the lines of St. Augustine, you can do as you please. You know what he said? Love God, then do as you please. Man that loves God. He's not going to hurt his neighbor or himself so he can do as he please. So that August in my life, I have to watch out for that hot dryness that can really smother the soul. Because I'm not going to make any amends. Made a list of all persons we've harmed and became willing. You see, I had to pray and ask Almighty God to make me willing to be willing. Because I was not willing. I make amends? For what? Mm-mm. Well, we go back and read the book again. It said that some of these we bought. And that was one I bought that making amends. Oh, no. Uh uh-uh, uh. I'm not making no amends. But you know, there's something about making amends, I'll tell you this, that happened to me, and I hope it never happens to you. If I do not make amends when I'm wrong, it goes like this for me. You see that person place a thing on your plate every time you get ready to eat. Mm-hmm. I become that person's slave. If they're coming down the street, I go another way to keep from meeting them. Or I start looking in a window, you know, at lawnmowers and snowblowers and things like that, so I don't have to talk to them, you know. And I don't know anything about lawnmowers and snowblowers, but I'll look there. And they'll touch you on the shoulder, hello, Hallie. Oh, I didn't see you. So not only did I make, not make amends, but I started lying about it. You know? Mm-hmm. It's some of these we bought. And finally, when you go to sleep at night, this person plays the thing, lays on your pillow. You don't want to sleep with everybody, do you? Hmm. Hot and dry. But yet I say that I am sober. But finally, the ninth step will tell me that I made direct amends to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. That's the lovely month of September, direct amends. You know, in September, isn't it wonderful? The air has cooled to a certain extent, and the sky looks bluer than it ever was before. And you'll see just small white clouds drifting by, you know. Mm -hmm. And you feel good. You say, everything about this is wonderful. And it is when I make direct amends. Yeah? Direct amends. That's what happens, you know. You say, well, you know, there is a holiday in this month, in September. There's Labor Day. When you make direct amends, that's Labor Day. I'm telling you, you will labor. I know I did. You know, go past, I ought to go back and tell so-and-so such and such a thing. And my mind says, no, you know, it's not, this, the timing is all wrong. Sure, there's the timing can be wrong, but it was always going to be wrong for me, you know what I mean? So this person became another me, and I said, I've got to do something about this. Because I wanted my life to be like that sky. I wanted it to be blue. See. And I wanted to feel free. And this was the only thing that I know that could free me. It would be my direct amends. You know, it tells me here in the tenth step that I must continue to take a personal inventory and promptly admit when I'm wrong. You know? There's another holiday, I don't suppose it's a holiday, but it's a day that comes along in that tenth step, in the month of October. It's very bad for people like me, you know. That's Halloween. 
comes in October, you know. We find ourselves putting on a mask. See how the, the masquerade is over for me. For people like me, there can be no more masquerade. When I find myself, when I continue to take a personal inventory and I find myself putting on a mask, I must promptly remove that mask. For the simple reason is, any time one wears a mask, he's representing something that he or she is not. And when one represents what he or she is not, you may be dealt back what you can't take. So how can you handle it? If I represent one thing and I, and this is handed back to me, am I ready to cope with it, you know? So I cannot afford to wear this mask, but I must continue to see if I am not a bit putting on one to representing something that I am not, pretending to be that which I'm not. You know, sometimes... We wear the mask of sobriety. We're forgetting the masquerade is over. Wear the mask of sobriety and you're still taking pills and smoking pot. But you're wearing the mask of sobriety. Well, it says alcohol. But you're still getting high. Hmm? Well, I can take this or I can take that, but that's for... But, but I, I just didn't drink anything. Yeah, well, you got high right on, didn't you? Hmm? This is Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. So hence it is, my friends. Am I wearing the mask of sobriety? And still holding on to my old ideas that it's all right to do this in AA because uh, it just says don't drink alcohol. Well, we in AA don't like it. No, we don't. So now, my friends, comes along that beautiful 11th step where one sought through prayer and meditation to improve his conscious contact with God, praying only for the knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. This is November. This is the thanksgiving of my life. You know? A big feast. We rejoice at Thanksgiving time. We rejoice. From the moment that I declare this, that I accept this step, it is Thanksgiving for me. I don't have to wait till I've been sober five months or six months or this length of time to say that it's time for me to rejoice. This is it. It was once a woman, you know. It was her find this ambition to travel around the world. She said, before I die, there's one thing that I want to do. I want to take a boat trip around the world. And uh, so she saved her money. And she bought up a whole lot of sardines and spam and whatever stuff like that one eats. And she says, now, and she put them all down in her stateroom. And she says, I'm going to leave this down here, and I'm not going up to eat because it'll cost too much but I have my fare paid and I have got my this trip around the world and I'll go down in my cabin here and I will eat down here until the last night out then I will go upstairs and I will have a feast so that on the last night out she went upstairs and she ordered a scrumptious meal and then she called to the waiter and she said to him what is my bill he says, Bill, you don't owe any bill. She said, what do you mean? She, he said, uh, she said, I want to pay for this food. He said, Madam, when you purchased the ticket, all of your meals were included in it. Don't cheat yourself. You will find something to be thankful for and grateful for. Don't ever feel that, well, I don't think it's time for me to have this yet. I'm not worthy of this. Of course you're not worthy of it. Who is? 
But my God wants me to have it because I am his child. And he is my father and I am his heir. And you and I are royal people. Have you ever had kids and they would sometimes they make you, you know, upset you a little bit there. And you say, well, I'm going to, you know, you'd feel like you'd like to kind of shake them up a little sometimes. But you still are good to them because they are your children. Why? Because you're hoping that they will be thankful and grateful and be better people. So you give them nice things. You know? You don't say, I'm going to wait until you are an absolutely good boy before I give you this. You'll have to wait and you'll have a beard hanging down around your knees and he will do, as far as that's concerned. And now, we come to Christmas, the month of December. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to the alcoholic and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Every day is Christmas for you and I. And you and I have a Christmas party every meal, every, every meeting we go to, don't we? Because we give of ourselves and we share. We don't have to wait for one day of the year. Not just amongst us. But when that day comes, we give more. But every meal, every, every meeting that I sit at, you're giving me something and I'm trying to share what I have with you. I learned something when I was in the fourth grade. I think that was about the only grade I didn't get expelled from. But it stuck with me and I've learned to use it since I've been in here. It's not what we give, but what we share. For the gift without the giver is bare. But he who gives from his heart feeds three. Himself, his hungering neighbor, and me. Thank you.